Well, welcome to our morning worship from Great Clacton Parish this morning, filming today from St Mark's Church, where you can see that we've just still got the Christmas decorations uh, up. One last time uh, to see those on YouTube for this year. We've still got our Advent and Christmas uh, candles here. It's technically still the Christmas uh, season. Uh, T explained a couple of weeks ago how um, in, in the church Christmas doesn't just last for a day, but it's a, a period afterwards. In fact, the Christmas message is valuable for the whole of the year. And so I'm just going to light our Advent and Christmas uh, candles once more, one final time. And maybe more than ever at the start of this new year, it's good and important for us to remember that Jesus came into the world as the light of the world. And the Bible tells us that we can still know his light in our lives today and every day. And so as we reflect on that, I'm going to pray the collect for today, the second Sunday of Christmas. Almighty God, in the birth of your Son, you have poured on us the new light of your incarnate word and shown us the fullness of your love. Help us to walk in his light and dwell in his love that we may know the fullness of his joy, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, as we're at the beginning of a new year, many of us take this opportunity to pause and to reflect on our own lives, as I guess people across the country are doing, and pause and reflect on the situation that our country is in and a difficult situation, a very difficult time for many people at the moment. And we're going to be thinking about what it means to live as a Christian at this time. We've got a bit of a theme through our next few weeks of starting a new year. And today we're thinking about starting a new year, living Jesus' way. We're going to look at the Beatitudes, those um, sayings that Jesus said when he spoke at the Sermon on the Mount about how to be blessed by God, how to, to um, have a, a blessed life. And we'll be reflecting on how those can shape our own lives as Christians today. First of all, we're going to sing together. We still can't sing when we meet in our buildings. We love to sing, so we sing in our own homes as we meet online. Rachel's going to lead us in a great hymn that as well helps us to reflect at this time. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven.
Well, in that wonderful hymn, we don't just praise God, but we remember our need of him. Praise him for his grace and favour to our fathers in distress. Praise him still the same forever, slow to chide and swift to bless. We've had a year of distress, or nearly a year of distress, for, for many people. And many of us are clinging on to God and his promises at this time. Father, like he tends and spares us, well our feeble frame he knows. In his hand he gently bears us. Many of us are feeling our own frailty at this time. A frailty that's both physical and spiritual. And we need to, to look to God as the one who can rescue us. And we'll be returning to that and thinking about it during the service. We will have our children's spot in just a few minutes' time. But first, uh, one or two notices. And first of all, I have some sad news to share with everybody. Because uh, during the last week... Very sadly, Jeff, one of our members at St John's, has died. He uh, was taken to Colchester Hospital, um, seriously ill, and uh, sadly he passed away there. And I want to say a big thank you to his friends from St John's who uh, raised the alarm that he wasn't well and made it possible for us to uh, get him across to the hospital uh, in the ambulance but uh, very sadly he didn't recover uh, after after that so we're just going to pause as we always do in these circumstances and give thanks for Jeff's life a faithful Christian man a faithful member of our church family so father God we do thank you uh, for Jeff we thank you for how he knew you we thank you for how he put his trust in you. We thank you for how he looked to you in all circumstances. And we th can thank you now that he is safely with you, free from trouble, free from pain. We thank you for his friendships within the church family here and his friends at St John's who helped him even right at the end. And we do pray for all who mourn for him at this time and who are sad. We pray that they may know your comfort just now. For we pray it in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just one or two uh, notices. Things are at a time of change at the moment. And we... Uh, we can't be sure what's going to happen over these coming weeks. With the situation here in Clacton much more difficult than it has been up to now in terms of infection rates, a number of people are choosing to stay at home for the services uh, in January and join us online rather than in our buildings, and that's absolutely fine. We uh, think that's probably a good idea for many people uh, to do that and do just try and join in one way or another. If you can let us know in the uh, office or me, me personally that you're doing that, it just helps us to keep in, in touch with you at the moment. And a number of people have done that over the last few days already. We will keep going with our service pattern of a short service at nine o'clock in St John's, a short service at 10 o'clock at St Mark's, and then 11 o'clock online uh, on a Sunday morning, as long as we are able. But we are just taking extra precautions in those live services to keep them as safe as possible. Then also today, we've got our four o'clock family time when we have another uh, story uh, from a storybook all about the Lord Jesus. That's at four o'clock today. Then during the week, we think it's best not to meet in person for early morning prayers at the moment. And so uh, we're cancelling those uh, in our buildings. But instead, we're going to put 
various things online for uh, people to join in with and to pray. You can uh, ask me for an, uh, to join with WhatsApp prayers on a, a Monday morning or uh, on YouTube, Tuesday morning, Phil leads morning prayers. And next Sunday, our evening prayers start up again at six o'clock. And we may look to put other ways of praying together as we can't meet together uh, over the coming weeks. And please do pray especially for Mike and his family as it's Pauline's funeral this Tuesday at 10.30. Wednesday worshippers will now meet for a short morning prayer service each week at 11 o'clock at St Mark's. And we've decided to postpone next week's Holy Communion on a Sunday morning till a later date. We'll have a morning prayer service at, instead at St John's and St Mark's. But we are encouraging people at this time to, to keep in touch in as many ways as possible. So you're welcome to join uh, me for Zoom tea and coffee after this service. Even if you haven't, ha haven't had an invite yet, do get in touch with me. Uh, give me a ring just now and I'll get an invite for that out to you. And we're stopping a number of other things uh, during this month. Our children's work and youth work will move online. That searchlights and Ignite will move online. There won't be any at uh, Bethany uh, th th this month, and Together is going to stop for a month as well. But instead, on Thursday mornings from 10 to 12, we will open the church, St John's Church, for private prayer. Well, I think that's uh, enough. Uh, Notice there's enough changing round of things just at the moment. Uh, do, as I say, keep in touch with one another if you can. And I bring special greetings from two people who asked me to pass on their greetings uh, to you this morning. That's from Rosemary and from Margaret. And they wish you all a very happy new year. They're sorry that they can't join in uh, at our live services at the moment, but uh, they uh, join in online and on CD and feel very much still part of our church family. So happy new year from Rosemary and also from Margaret. Well, we've got some birthdays this week and we're going to sing happy birthday to them and to anybody else who has a birthday that we don't know about. So it's Phyllis's birthday today and then it's June's, Pam's and Lisa's this week as well. So for them and anybody else, we're going to sing... Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Phyllis, June, Pam and Lisa. Happy birthday to you. And a round of applause. Well, we come now to our children's spot. Now, last week, the children were set a challenge by tea. And that was to think how this message of Christmas applies all year. If you remember, he showed us that video that he had made back in the summer when uh, the Good Fruit Club had celebrated Christmas in the summertime and asked the children to, to do a picture of some strange place or time to, to celebrate Christmas. Well, Lydia, as well as doing a, a picture of the traditional Christmas scene, thought about celebrating Christmas in the summer on the beach. And Zoe had a, a beach picture, but also thought about celebrating Christmas underwater, under the sea. Uh, and I think that's her, her friend the shrimp has come back into that picture again. Really brilliant. So Christmas messages apply, well, all the time and absolutely everywhere. Thank you for those wonderful pictures. Well, for today's children's spot and today's children's challenge, this is something I recorded with Daniel just a little bit earlier. On Christmas Day, T was telling us that one of his favourite things about Christmas was eating lots of food. And I'm sure that's true of many of us. 
There's lots of really lovely things about Christmas and one of the things is the food we can enjoy. And sometimes we just think to ourselves, Ooh, I'm really hungry. Our children say it, we think it ourselves, and we might say, Oh well, to start with anyway, maybe you'd like something nice and healthy. We like our Brussels sprouts at Christmas. We like, no? What about some carrots? Or some parsnips? Ah, oh, I'm really hungry. Oh, well, what about a, a satsuma? They're really good for you. Oh, I'm still really hungry. Oh dear, okay. Um, really hungry? Oh, I know. Well, we have got some Christmas biscuits. Oh, I'm still really hungry. Some more Christmas biscuits? Um, I'm still really hungry. Some more Christmas biscuits? Not quite there. I'm still really hungry. Oh, uh, well, we've got some chocolate fingers. No, I'm still really hungry. Uh, some some chocolate robins. Still really hungry. Uh, um, some chocolate chocolates. No, still hungry. Uh, some other sweets. Mm, not really hung. Not really. I'm still hungry. I'm still hungry. Some chocolate buttons. No, still hungry. Oh dear, really hungry. I don't know how to feed the children at all. And sometimes as adults we go, oh, I'm really hungry as well. I I would like some more food. And and then we might say, oh well, I'll have a bit once we've had the the carrots and the uh, parsnips and the uh, Brussels sprouts, well at least maybe one Brussels sprout, and the uh, satsumas, then we might say, oh, I really would like a bit of Christmas cake. Or uh, maybe another sort of Christmas cake. Or oh, maybe a bit of, a bit of fudge. And we think, oh, I really like some of that lovely Christmas food that we can enjoy. Not to mention that sometimes we hear someone say, Oh, I'm really thirsty. And they might like a drink of milk. I like a drink of milk. Sometimes they like a drink of milk. But sometimes they still say, No, I'm really thirsty. And they might like something, uh, uh, something, a bit of a treat for, for, for Christmas. And even sometimes adults go, Oh, I'm really thirsty. All that, that Christmas cake. They might like a cup of tea. Oh, where's the teapot? Need that as well. Oh. Or even sometimes adults think, Actually, what I really want is something else uh, to, 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 to drink. Milk's not going to do it, or tea's not going to do it today. I'm really thirsty as well. All these wonderful things we can enjoy at Christmas time. In today's reading from the Bible, Jesus tells us to hunger and thirst after something else. Sometimes, especially at Christmas, we hunger and thirst after all the good food and all the good drinks that we can enjoy. But Jesus tells us to hunger and thirst after righteousness, after righteousness. That's all the right things there are, the right things of God. So maybe hunger and thirst after God's ways, to want to, to follow him more closely. Maybe to hunger and thirst after Jesus and his forgiveness. And at the beginning of a new year, it's not a bad thing to think. I wonder what I'm going to focus on, I'm going to really want this year. And maybe as well as, well we maybe think I, I shouldn't hunger and thirst after all this uh, food quite so much after Christmas. But we could think there's some things I can hunger and thirst and really want. And that's God's ways. That's Jesus' forgiveness. That's to be close with him 
in the coming year. So today's challenge, children, is this. Could you draw a picture or take a photograph or even make it in Lego or something like that of a, a, a picture of a plate with some of your favourite food on it? Some things with, that we really hunger and maybe a favourite drink that we thirst after. And then think, actually, this year, it'd be great if I could hunger and thirst after righteousness, after all God's good things that he wants to give us even more than after the chocolate buttons or the biscuits or the Christmas cake. That's the challenge, the children's challenge for today. I would love to see those pictures when they're finished. Well, we know a song about doing that. I'm following the King. And it's the one that Phil and the family recorded for us. It's time for I'm Following the King, which is one of our favourites that we do at church. And there are some actions to this as well. But Lydia, would you like to help us do the actions and Zoe? Yeah. Help us do the yeah. actions? I'm, I'm following the King. Yeah. And this is a really, really good one, okay? So one of Jesus' uh, famous sayings, one of his Beatitudes, from Matthew uh, chapter 5. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. I don't know what you're like uh, about New Year's resolutions. Um, maybe with all that's going on, many of us have really thought about New Year's resolutions this year. But to take a verse like that, or maybe one of the other Beatitudes of the Lord Jesus, wouldn't be a bad thing to take and hold on to for, uh, for, for this coming year. Well, we're going to have a look at all of these sayings of Jesus as we think about living Jesus' way at the beginning of this uh, new year. In a few minutes' time, Mark Wallace who is a vicar of St Peter's Church in Colchester, part of, part of his week and part-time is the chaplain to uh, Bishop Rod Thomas. He's going to be our guest uh, speaker for today. We're grateful for this sermon and a number of others we've been using just over the past few Sundays and we'll use again next Sunday uh, a sermon from the Church Society. We're grateful to them for those. And he's going to be reflecting a little bit back on the past year and looking forward to the coming year and using Jesus' teaching here to help him do that. Just to say he recorded this uh, sermon just a, a few weeks ago uh, before the beginning of uh, 2021. And so he, he kind of uh, mentions uh, that in his, his talk. 
First of all, Leslie's going to read uh, this part of Matthew chapter 5 to us, and then Mark's going to come and speak to us. Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, we bow in your presence. May your word be our rule, your spirit our teacher, and your greater glory our supreme concern. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, 2020 is turning out to be an extraordinary year. The global pandemic, of course, has been bad enough. But on top of that, we have had uh, politi the political crises of uh, Brexit and the American elections. The crisis of racial tension exposed after the death of George Floyd. Think of the financial crisis uh, around the world at the moment. Uh, and that's even before we start remembering other things like how close we came to World War Three with Iran back in January. Uh, the murder hornets of which we heard so much. The Australian fires. And when you put it all like that, I'm slightly nervous about what's going to happen just in the few days between me recording this and you coming to watch this sermon. We thought 2019 was bad. 2020 has turned out to be, frankly, pretty horrific. And I don't even think what 2021 will be like. And I want to ask today, in the light of all of this, what sort of people should Christians be? What sort of people should Christians be? Because the more tumultuous life gets around us, the clearer we need to be on how we should live. There are the dangers, for example, of being blown off course in life by all the things that are going on around us. There's the dangers of questioning all the values and the priorities and the agenda that we have. There's even the danger, of course, of finding ourselves suddenly having the ground swept away beneath our feet. And I want to address all of that in the light of this passage in Matthew chapter 5, from verses 1 to 12. Now, throughout Christian history, as you're probably aware, there's been quite a tendency to elevate some Christians above others. And, and this is ever so unfortunate because it gives that sense of there being a, a two-tier system of Christians, as if you have uh, the great saints like Paul and Peter and Mary, and they're the ones who have feast days named after them and churches dedicated to them. And then beneath that, you have the lesser saints, basically everybody else, people I'm afraid like you and me. But that's not the way the Bible looks at it. It's certainly not the way that God looks at it. And we're going to see in this passage here that all Christians are blessed. We'll see how that pans out in just a moment. Uh, and we're going to be reminded, therefore, that all Christians have the great privileges of being saints. There is no two tier system as if some saints are greater than others. And I hope, by the way, that will give you great confidence. We'll come to that in a few moments time. But I think it's particularly important this year, given the global pandemic and all the difficulties that we've had. We've had to say goodbye to many loved Christian people, often without really having the chance to say a proper goodbye to them. And so this year we will be pausing to reflect and to give thanks for their lives, 
but also for all that they received from God. And with that in mind, let's now dive straight into this passage and, and see what we see here. Because I, I want, first of all, to let us consider a Christian's character. Now, it's often been observed that the first four Beatitudes, that's verses three through to six, are all about a Christian's relationship with God. That is the, the poor in spirit, uh, those who mourn, uh, the meek and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Predominantly about a Christian relating, relating to God. Whereas the second four, that's uh, verse seven through to twelve, is concerned with relationships with one another. That is the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers. And verses 10 to 12, those who are persecuted for righteousness. And I think that's probably a helpful way of looking at these verses and these eight different Beatitudes. But as much as anything else, they remind us, therefore, that we're not thinking about eight different people here. These are characteristics that all Christians have. It's not as if some of us get to be the poor in spirit, whereas others get to be the merciful. No, no, all Christians, all believers should display all of these characteristics. So with that in mind, let's take a look, shall we, at what Jesus says here in this Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That is, those who acknowledge their spiritual poverty before God. Or in the next verse, blessed are those who mourn. That is, those who grieve or are sorrowful over their own failings. Not, by the way, those who grieve over the failings of others. Uh, most of us can manage that. No, no, this is those who grieve and are sorrowful over their own failings. Blessed are the meek, says Jesus. That is, the gentle, the humble. And perhaps in this context, in particular, those who are meek because they understand themselves to be sinners. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That is, those who have, if you like, a healthy appetite for spiritual things. Many people, of course, have a healthy, a healthy appetite for all sorts of material things. But Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for spiritual things, for righteousness in particular. And then as we go into the second four, blessed are the merciful, verse seven. That is, those who are kind to those who need help. Like God is kind, like God is merciful. Blessed are those who are kind to those in need. Blessed are those, verse eight, who are pure in heart. That is sincerely pure, not just looking good on the outside, but being good on the inside. There's a depth to their purity, right into their hearts. They're not doing things to be pure, purely for show. It's a sense of who they really are. Blessed are the peacemakers, verse nine. That is those who are involved in the work of reconciling people, reconciling people to one another. Of course, also reconciling people to God by sharing the gospel with them. And this is divine work, isn't it? Bringing people back together, reconciling their differences and making peace where there was no peace. Well, blessed are those who go about that work in whatever form it might take. And verses 10 to 12, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness's sake. Because it won't always be easy to be peacemakers, or indeed any of these different characteristics that we see here. The world will often oppose and it will persecute. Well, blessed are those who endure hostility from other people for being a Christian. John Stott has suggested that persecution is simply the clash between two irreconcilable 
value systems. And all Christians will experience something of that. But blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Now, that might all seem in one sense a little bit simple, a little bit basic. Isn't it just stating the obvious, Jesus, to begin your Sermon on the Mount with these Beatitudes? But just for a moment, reflect, if you will, on the impact of Christians showing this kind of character for all the difficulties that we faced in this year. Think the differences it will make of uh, Christians with this kind of character, both in the public square and in the private realm. Think of the difference it will make. Think of how this kind of character will stand out. Think of how uh, we will see this kind of character make a difference in the world. And of course, the world will notice when Christians live in this kind of way. I think it was PJ O'Rourke who said that everybody wants to save the world, but nobody wants to wash the dishes. And I think there's something of that in the Beatitudes. In that for Christians, everybody wants to save the world, but nobody wants the hard work of growing in Christian character. So let me ask you before we move on, which of these is the greatest challenge for you? As you look at these eight different aspects of Christian character, which is the one that you currently find the hardest? Or to ask the same question in a slightly different way, as you look at the, uh, say, the week ahead or the month ahead, what situation do you have coming up that will need this kind of character to be displayed? And what will be the biggest challenge for you in that? Or if you think of the relationships around you at home or at work or at church, wherever it may be, what relationship issue or even what relationship breakdown? will need this kind of character to be being displayed. Well, there's something of a challenge there, isn't there, I think, for all of those who would call themselves Jesus's disciples, that our Christian character should match up to what we see here. But secondly then, having uh, considered a Christian's character, I want to reflect a little bit on a Christian's confidence. Now, I'm sure you notice that each of these Beatitudes starts with the word blessed. That, by the way, is why they are called the Beatitudes. These are the people who are blessed, the blessed ones. And sometimes that word blessed can be translated happy. So happy are those who show this kind of character. And there's an element of truth in that, I think, as well. Although happiness is very subjective and sometimes it comes, sometimes it goes, even for the most mature of Christians, I think probably. Sticking with the word blessed is the most helpful, isn't it? Blessed are those who live this way because, well, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Look at what their inheritance will be, both in the first beatitude, verse 3, but also then again towards the end in the last one, in verse 10. The mourners will be comforted, verse 4. The meek shall inherit the earth. And those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who have that appetite for spiritual things, well, they shall be satisfied. And when we stop to think of it like that, unlikely as it all might sound, does this not give us great confidence that God has got everything under control? And when we know that his word can be trusted, we can put ourselves into his hands. Or as we go on into uh, verse 7, the merciful shall receive mercy. Likewise, the pure in heart shall see God. What a privilege that will be one day. And likewise, the peacemakers shall be called sons of God. Those involved in the divine work will be part of the divine family. Now, I hope this gives you some great sense of confidence. But it's worth remembering, isn't it, that uh, where the Christian's confidence lies is is not in our circumstances, 
not in looking at our diaries or our bank balance and reflecting on, on how well things are going. No, no. Christian confidence doesn't come from there. It comes in the blessing of God, in the certain assurance that what he promises is true. And when he said that people who live this way will be blessed, that we know this will be true for all of us. Christian confidence comes not in what we provide for ourselves, but in what God graciously gives us. But there is a problem here, isn't there? And it's important before we finish that we, we, we stop and, and address this, because after all, who amongst us can claim to have lived this way? As we read through these Beatitudes, I imagine there's a sense for all of us in which we're aware that they expose something of our spiritual failings. Just as the Old Testament law ex exposed the sense to which God's people fell short of God's standards, so too these Beatitudes here, and indeed the whole Sermon on the Mount, exposes something of the way in which Jesus' disciples failed to match up to Jesus' standards. And in the sense, therefore, that they show us how far short we've fallen of God's standards, do they not only make the problem worse? Well, they reveal that we can't please God. We cannot do this on our own. But of course, in doing so, we reflect on the fact that they drive us back to the Lord Jesus Christ once more. We go to him for forgiveness. Forgiveness for, for having not been the poor in spirit or those who mourn or are meek and so on and so forth. And we go to Jesus and we ask for his forgiveness. And because of his death on the cross, where he took all of our failures upon himself, we need not fear and we know that we can be forgiven. Father, we pray, I haven't lived this way. I can't live this way. Please, will you forgive me? And because of Jesus, then, of course, we are forgiven. But then, having been forgiven, we are sent out to go and live this way for the rest of our lives. The reformers remind us time and again that the law sends us to Christ to be justified. But then Christ sends us to the law to be sanctified. And so again, we see that our confidence is not in ourselves. It's not in our ability to sort things out for ourselves, nor even is it in our ability to live this way. But it is in what God is doing in us and for us. Our forgiveness is in Jesus and our blessing that we receive will be from God throughout our lives. And of course, as we return to the crises of this year, with all that this year has held, with all the uncertainty and the anxiety it's brought, and as we look to the future, to next year, with all the anxiety and the fears there may well be, here is true Christian confidence. The promise of blessing for those who will live this way, combined with the promise of forgiveness when we fall short of it. And here is the confidence that we will need this year and every year. Here is the solid ground on which we can place our feet, confident that it won't be washed away beneath us. And that whatever might happen, and this year has reminded us that some terrible things can happen, we can be confident. We can be confident in our God in his word and in his promises. And with that in mind, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we thank you for the great promise of blessing in your word, we pray for your help that we might live this way. Forgive us when we fall short. Help us to see how we might better follow this way of life that you put before us. And then help us today, this week, for the rest of this year, for the rest of our lives, to live this blessed life. And we ask it, not just that we might make a difference in the world, but supremely, that we might please you in all we do.
And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Let's take a moment to respond in song to what we've just heard, knowing that our confidence can be in uh, the Lord Jesus, that the Christian's confidence can be there, as well as wanting him to be the one who shapes our character. And we're going to sing, My life is in you, Lord. helpfully told us that one thing that Jesus's Beatitudes, these sayings of how to be blessed in life, one thing that they do is that they remind us of our failure to live in this way, our, our failure to live up to the Christian character we would want to have. And so they send us back to Jesus for his forgiveness. And if we admit that we are poor in spirit, if we do mourn for our own failings, if we have a meekness that admits that we need help, and we want the righteousness that only Jesus can give, if we have that sort of attitude, it will drive us to ask for, for God's forgiveness through the Lord Jesus. So let's do that now in a prayer of confession, both confessing our sin and asking for forgiveness and new life through the Lord Jesus. Some words are gonna come up on the screen and let's pray them together. Almighty God, long suffering and of great goodness, I confess to you, I confess with my whole heart, my neglect and forgetfulness of your commandments, my wrongdoing, thinking 
and speaking. The hurts I have done to others and the good I have left undone. O oh God, forgive me, for I have sinned against you and raise me to newness of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord Jesus promises, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Lord God loves to forgive through Jesus Christ. And so we can pray. May God the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. And we're going to sing a great hymn now that reminds us uh, not to fear, but to delight in the fact that there's forgiveness through the Lord Jesus, before the throne of God above. Rachel's going to lead us in singing this one. And as we continue to think about what it means to live Jesus' way at the beginning of this new year, and what it might not mean, we're going to have a little reflection, a little video reflection, provided by Go Chatter videos, especially for the new year. Well, that's it. Christmas is done said goodbye to family and all the festive fun, eating way too much food, please, no more snacks. 
It's a new year, a new me, so it's time to come back. I've made myself a promise, I'm gonna get fitter. Let's go to the gym, this year I won't be a quitter. I'm thinking a six month membership, eight days a week. Lifting and running to put me in peak condition. I'll eat less, skip on the chocolate. Then I can save a few pennies for the wallet. I know, I'll go vegan. Maybe that resolution I'll keep. Or I save my Burger King order to one, maybe two days a week. I'm gonna organize myself better get into routine, spend more time with family instead of in front of a screen. I'll spend less money, I'll save more, travel more, read more, sleep more. I'll make more promises that I can't keep more. My New Year's resolutions are great for a week, but the truth is, these are empty promises. Truth is, by February, my diet will be gone, my gym membership wasted, and I'll be back to being on a screen all day frustrated. These promises show me what I want to be, but not what I am. They show me an ideal, not a real picture. These New Year's resolutions don't help me. They're a promise I can't keep. I long for a promise that makes me feel better, not a New Year's resolution that makes me its debtor. And when I look to myself, it's not something I find, because when I look to myself, I make myself blind to the world around me that shows a promise spoken, that even inside a world that's so broken, there's a God who loves me, one who's in control. And while the failure in me scores an own goal, he's right there beside me. His rescue is promised, and he doesn't break it because God's not dishonest. He sends his son so that I can be free. His message, hope, is not found in me, but in him. He promises a future day with no pain, with no gym needed, no stressy weight gain. I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds great. So why not this new year do more than just fake? Don't aim for the hopeless endless resolution. Look to Jesus, the real promise solution. Well, we can be so grateful that the Lord Jesus has come to bring that forgiveness, to bring that confidence in God that only he can bring and because it's still Christmas and because this is a great song of joy we're going to sing joy to the world the Lord has come joy to the world the Saviour reigns our Christmas candle is still lit we can afford to have one more of those great carols that our music group recorded at St John's just before Christmas and this is a great one to take with us into the new year.
Well, we come now to a time to pray together. And Catherine is going to lead us in some prayers that she's especially put together for this, the first Sunday of a new year. Good morning, everybody, and Happy New Year to you. I was slightly concerned when I saw I was down for the prayers of the new year. I felt like my life was still on hold from March 2020. However, God is good, and via the BBC website, he prompted me to pray today based on the Archbishop of Wales Christmas message, which was, we should pull together and look to the light. Shall we pray? The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We come to you this morning at the start of another year, and yet we all still carry the cloak of the old year that hangs over and darkens every corner of our world. But you, Lord, are the light of the world. In you there is no darkness. We praise you for the hope and joy we have within that can only come from you, even in these dark days. Amen. During 2020, we added some new words to our daily vocabulary. Among them were furlough, homeworker, shielding and isolation. As time has gone on, we've seen these words are triggers for words we already know. Anxiety, vulnerability, loneliness, poverty and fear. We pray for those, Lord, who feel that they are living in darkness. We pray, Lord, that your light will break through, bringing a new dawn to our nation and all the nations of the world. A time when the world, having fallen to its knees, lifts up its hands to the coming King for strength, mercy, hope and your unfailing love. We pray for those known to us who suffer in body, mind or spirit that they will be washed anew in the light of your love and find comfort in you this year. Amen. Jesus said, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. We pray for all the key workers and caregivers around the world. We thank you, Lord, that we have had so many opportunities this year to applaud and appreciate their bravery and commitment. We thank you, Lord, that your symbol of hope, the rainbow, has become a familiar sight and brought comfort and strength to so many. We pray, Lord, for all those who continue the fight against COVID-19, those who help those that are affected, and those who keep all this going, public transport workers, caretakers and cleaners, those involved in supply lines, and those on the front line, the carers and the teachers. We especially lift you, our brothers and sisters in Christ, who have these roles. We pray that they will know they are the hands, feet and heart of Christ and are shining a light for you, just as you commanded. Amen. And finally, I'll close with the collect for New Year's Day. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose years never fail and whose mercies are new every returning day, let the radiance of your spirit renew our lives, warming our hearts and giving light to our minds, that we may pass the coming year in joyful obedience and firm faith through him who is the beginning and the end, your Son, Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, as we come to the end of our time together this morning, let me thank you for joining us today. Let me say to the, any children that have been watching and joined in with our Children's Challenge, I'd love to see those pictures or photographs um, that you've taken for the Children's Challenge today. Uh, do email those in. And we want to continue to pray for the year ahead. And we're going to do that in the words of this great hymn. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. We want the Lord God to be our vision for the year ahead as we have confidence in him 
as we hold on to the Lord Jesus' teaching, wanting to, to live his way, knowing his forgiveness for our feelings, letting his words guide us. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Pam's going to lead us as we sing together. And a final prayer that expresses our confidence in the Lord Jesus. And after this, a special song that Pam has recorded that uh, she was pointed to and thought might be a good song for us as we start this new year together. She will play us out. But first of all, let's pray. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.